So welcome to the first in a series of three or maybe four talks about gut healing. We've done lots of gut healing lifestyle classes here before at the Functional Medicine Center, um, but this is the first one of this format where we've broken it up into smaller pieces. And so today we're definitely gonna, going to talk about the symptoms, the testing, and the treatment for gut issues. I'm going to turn off the video, like I said, around 1240 to allow time for questions. I mean, I'm going to turn off the recording. Um, and then we can add, I can add a few case studies. If you guys don't have any questions, I can add a little bit more info at the end. Um, please type your questions in the chat as we go, if you feel comfortable. And if it's something that feels a little private and you don't want to type it in the chat for everyone, you can actually just direct message me in the chat. Um, and it'll be anonymous who sent me the message. If you have any questions about that and you just would rather email, you could also email your questions to Brandy, which is brandy at the functional medicine center.org. And she will anonymously put, give them to me. Does that make sense? So if you have issues learning with the chat, then don't worry about it. Um, and then Kelly, yes. And Kelly, at the end, I'm going to go through the whole schedule. So everybody's reminded, but one week from today, Friday at noon, Kelly's going to be on zoom with a group discussion about basically how to achieve, hold on one sec. Josh just brought me food and I said, can you put it in the fridge? Okay. So how can we achieve the things that I'm suggesting? And this is to mirror the way that Kelly and I work together, because I want to remind everybody, I'm going to send out an email this weekend, but I'm reminding you that I've handpicked Kelly and Kristen, right? Because Kelly is our wellness coach. Kristen's our nurse practitioner. They're both very, very good at knowing exactly what I would say. And even more than that, they teach me things every day. So sometimes people are calling and asking only to talk to me, but I want to remind you that they are my right and left-hand women, and they're very good at this. So Kelly is there for wellness coaching. And a lot of times what that means is she translates some of my plan because I'm using all these medical words and she can translate it for you and then help you figure out how. If Kate asked you to do 16 things, that's a lot. Can Kelly help you figure out how? A lot of times breaking it down and Kelly's really good at that. So, all right, I'm gonna find my slides, but feel free to put any questions in the chat as we go. Okay, and so most of you already know me, but I have a master's in human nutrition and functional medicine that I got after my PA degree because I realized that what they taught me in PA school was a lot of um, disease and pharmaceuticals to treat those diseases, but not enough about the foods and the nutraceuticals or supplements that heal. And I just realized your faces are, there we go. So now I'm hiding the videos just, just until we're done. Um, oops. So I want to start with the symptoms and signs that you need to work on gut healing. So number one is diarrhea and constipation obviously. But in addition, if you see undigested food in your stool, feelings of incomplete bowel movements, um, skin issues like eczema or psoriasis, or this on the left, this is the butterfly shaped rash on your face, um, joint pain, brain fog, itchy scalp, dry scalp. And then eventually, if you've had gut, gut issues for many years, you develop seasonal allergies or vitamin deficiencies or food intolerances hormone deficiencies as well, and then autoimmune disease and cancer. And everything I'm saying is well supported in the literature. So we know that autoimmune disease, the, the root cause of autoimmune disease is in the gut. And we also know that immune dysfunction, which is what causes cancer, begins in the gut. So it all starts in the gut. There are quite a few causes of gut issues. And some of the biggest causes of gut issues are toxins that we are exposed to on a daily basis. So stress is a toxin because the liver has to filter stress out of the body just the same way that it would have to with plastics. And then on the left here, we have a picture of plastics to remind you that plastics like BPA and microplastics are toxins to our body. And unfortunately, when we eat fish, when we drink water, when we live in this world and breathe in the air, there's plastics everywhere. 
Caffeine also can cause gut issues in its own separate way. It causes leaky gut. Pesticides can overload the liver. And what happens with pesticides is that if the liver is backed up and overloaded, what comes right behind the liver in terms of detoxifying the body is the intestine. And so the liver will dump um, basically bile. So the gallbladder dumps bile, but the liver will help modulate the digestion of your food, especially glucose metabolism of your food. And all of that gets backed up when you're exposed to pesticides. So which pesticides? I mean, there aren't really any pesticides we should be consuming, um, which is so tricky. And we have to do the best we can because what I'm suggesting is that we live as clean as possible in terms of avoiding toxins, but it's never going to be perfect. So you kind of have to do one thing at a time and not let it overwhelm you because it can start to be overwhelming. If you go to ewg.org, you can read a lot more about the liver and pesticides and toxins. Um, but again, I encourage you to take it one step at a time. For example, maybe this week, look into water filters and maybe next week, look at all of your lotions and body products. We know that women are more likely to have gut issues because of the industry that markets us with beauty products, hair dyes, our toxins, um, any sort of like foundation or makeup usually contains toxins. Um, and Kelly, if you don't mind, if you could put in the chat, the app that you've also used to scan things, um, like that, yeah, I keep forgetting the name of it, but it's, you can scan a product like deodorant and find out if your deodorant contains toxins or how, how clean it is or how safe it is. Make sure. Yes. It's Yucca and I'll put it in right now. Thank you. Y U C A. I don't know why I can't remember it. Okay. Um, and then a few other things cause gut issues though. It's not just toxins and stress. If we are in sympathetic activation, which is basically our fight or flight, then that can cause gut issues mainly because we don't slow down to chew our food and the body doesn't do a good, good job of digesting food at the same time. Sorry. Is everybody muted? Will you make sure that you're muted just because I'm getting a little bit of feedback? Oh, here we go. I found it. It was Nicole. Okay. So um, make sure that you're sitting down and actually looking at your food. We do a lot of looking at our screen or talking about finances or talking about something stressful at the same time that we're eating. And that puts us in fight or flight when we're trying to digest and they don't work. Um, you can also have a tongue tie. And if your tongue is tethered underneath and it doesn't allow you to chew and make a healthy food bolus, then you end up getting leaky gut, which we're gonna go over in a minute. Um, rushing through meals, I already mentioned. Um, eating too fast, being in fight or flight, overuse of antibiotics is a big reason why people have gut issues. In fact, recent research in the last 10 years tells us if you've ever taken an antibiotic ever in your entire life, or if your mom had IV antibiotics during labor, your gut is forever altered to the extent that we can never get it back to what it was before antibiotics, but we can certainly do the best we can. Um, but I think that is alarming to hear that because you know, antibiotics are there for once or twice in a lifetime when you need them to save your life. But most patients I see are being given antibiotics multiple times, sometimes in a year for sinus issues, for lung issues. And we're not trying the herbs that are antimicrobial or the immune system support that we need to fight a virus. And then we're given an antibiotic, which does not fight a virus. That's kind of why I got into functional medicine. Okay. And then C-sections also cause gut imbalances. And that's because the baby's gut is sterile. So when you're in utero, there's no bacteria, good or bad in your gut. We really need the microbiome. That is the good bacteria, the good viruses, the good fungi. There's all three that should be in our gut. So as soon as we're born, if it were born through the vaginal canal, we breathe in and we swallow a bunch of really good gut flora. If that doesn't happen in your born C-section, then you start kind of at a deficit. It doesn't mean we can't work on it. It's just that know that if you're a C-section baby that you started with a deficit there. Formula feeding also causes gut dysbiosis as opposed to breastfeeding. Mold exposure. A lot of our patients have lived in or worked in water damaged buildings 
schools are sometimes the worst. We're slowly learning, especially in this area. And I would say that 90% of the homes in North Carolina have had some water damage at some point. Sometimes brand new homes have water damage. So somebody asked me yesterday, well, there's no way I have molds because my house was built in 2000. It's only 24 years old. Well, unfortunately, that's not the case. Airflow or cross breeze actually prevents mold. And some of our newer homes are airtight and that's actually creating a dark, moist environment for mold. Um, so if you're concerned that your home might have mold, let us know because we can tell you the best way to test for mold in your home. But don't forget your car could also have mold or your workplace or your church or your school. Um, Lyme disease is definitely a big cause of gut dysbiosis or gut issues in our patients. And that is partially because the Lyme disease looks like a spirochete and I'll show you a picture later on. And it builds biofilms or protective layers around it. And it takes a long time for the herbs that we use for Lyme disease to penetrate the biofilms and actually kill all the Lyme in the gut. I don't know if you know this, but 80% of your lymph system is actually surrounding the small intestine. And the small intestine is around 25, 30 feet long in most people, and it's all coiled up in your abdomen. And so most of your immune system, 75 to 80% of those lymph nodes are surrounding the small intestine, which means if you have an infection like Epstein-Barr, it is definitely affecting the gut. And candida is another thing that affects the gut. Um, candida is a friendly yeast that should not be causing any issues, but sometimes the other yeast and bacteria that suppress candida are depleted. And then that's what happens is we actually get candida or um, candida, and these are also yeast infections. So if you are someone who's prone to vaginal yeast infections, then you may also have candida in the gut. If you're someone who gets a white tongue and that you can clearly wipe off the coating of the white on your tongue, then you may also be prone to candida in your gut. Um, but it should be there just in very low amounts. And the problem is when it takes over and then you have way too much bad fungus and not enough of all the good stuff. Undiagnosed food sensitivities can also make the gut issues worse, although they're usually not the primary cause. Allergies, like for example, if you're breathing in cat dander, but you're allergic to cats, that can cause inflammation in the gut, which then makes the issues worse. And then additives in the food can also cause intolerances and gut dysbiosis. And by additives, I'm talking about things like yellow dye number five, or um, maltodextrin, which is corn-based, which they add to supplements. So we're getting into the nitty gritty and we're gonna back up a little bit and focus now on a, just a better explanation here. So I wanted to post that these are the top foods. These are the top nine foods that can trigger gut issues. Some people have an IgE reaction, which means they get hives and they're clearly allergic. They get red. They have an issue with these foods. Eventually with IgE, the reaction gets worse every time you're exposed to the food. And eventually you may have anaphylaxis, which is where you can't breathe. And that requires epinephrine or an EpiPen and you have to go to the hospital. However, most of our patients are not reacting with that kind of reaction. They're actually having more of an intolerance to the food, not an allergy. And these are the foods that we find most commonly popping up when we do testing. There's also, I gotta be honest, you don't wanna assume because if you can afford to do testing, it's always better to do testing because I'll show you some samples. But personally, I was reacting to milk and wheat for many years and took those out of my diet. I was reacting to peanuts and eggs for many years and I took that out. And my recent round of testing shows that now what I'm reacting to is totally different, right? So now um, coffee and blueberries and um, beef. So like totally different. And that's because it happens to be the things that I was eating really frequently when I was having gut issues issues, you know, and even though I've done a lot of things to heal my body since I was 16, when they told me I had chronic fatigue syndrome and PCOS and all the issues, um, even though I've been doing a lot of things to heal my body, certain things will, will basically cause me to have to start over and do more gut healing. So 2020, August of 2020 is when my autoimmune disease got way worse. And I think that's obvious. I was working seven days a week, taking care of people with COVID and I just got really stressed and the stress was enough to basically 
caused me to go do all retesting again, because I knew that there was something going on with my gut. So it can be discouraging, but I encourage you. I, I share personal things about my journey because I hope that when you hear it, um, it inspires you to not give up and to know that we are still whole and we still don't, you don't need to think of yourself as a sickly person. If you're having gut issues, you can still imagine all the things that are normal about you and, you know, gut issues in our society are very normal. So I would like to normalize the conversation. Okay. I'm going to take a sip of tea. So I wanted to point out here that the digestive system starts with the mouth. And this is why if you have a tongue tie or you're having trouble digesting carbs, there's probably an issue going on in your mouth. Maybe you're not chewing enough 30 to 40 times per bite. Maybe you're eating too fast and it's that simple. You're supposed to make amylase when, as soon as the food hits your tongue, actually, as soon as you smell the food, you're supposed to make amylase. And amylase is one of the enzymes that breaks down carbohydrates. So digestion begins in the mouth. And it is very important that you begin digesting in the mouth so that you don't have like a carbohydrate bolus sitting there where it hasn't been digested or broken down at all in the mouth before you swallow, because then the body's playing catch up and that can hugely affect your blood sugar. Studies show that if people chew their food all the way, their blood sugar is much more stable. And I think that's great because chewing is free. So I don't have to pay for any fancy expensive supplement. I just need to slow down, turn off my computer, turn off my phone and look at my food and chew it. Now, if you do have a tongue tire or you're concerned that that frenulum, that little stretchy piece under your tongue is too short or too tight, let me know because I can confirm it for you on exam if I haven't already told you. The other thing I wanted to point out here is that the stomach is pretty high up in the abdomen and a little bit on the left side of your body. So if you're having any acid heartburn or indigestion, you could have H. pylori, which I'm going to show you on the next screen. That can be a cause of GERD or reflux. And that can also be a sign that we need to do some gut healing. H. pylori is a bacteria that causes the lining of the stomach itself to get really red and inflamed. And we need to get rid of the H. pylori so that you can properly make your HCL. HCL is hydrochloric acid. Um, betaine HCL is how it's sold as a supplement. And usually when people have low HCL, they have a hard time digesting meat or protein. They tell me, you know, I try to chew that or I try to digest it. It just, it's like a rock in my stomach. And you can actually do a challenge where you take some BTN HCL and you take a few more tabs every single day until you get to the point where you're digesting your food better. Low stomach acid is often from increased stress and increased caffeine use. And sometimes um, cigarette smoking can cause low stomach acid. Next, we have the duodenum, and it doesn't show it here, but over here on the right side of the patient's body is the liver and the gallbladder, and then on the left is the pancreas. The pancreas releases digestive juices that help digest carbohydrates. It also releases insulin, but that's a different conversation for a different day. On the right, the liver, if the liver's having issues like cirrhosis or you have something called non-alcoholic fatty liver, the liver may not be helping you digest your food quickly enough. And sometimes people have a low metabolism and they're gaining weight. And it's because we need to really work on liver support, which again is a different conversation. A lot of times the gallbladder is hugely affected by mold and water damage buildings. Gallbladder is what you need in order to digest fat in your food. If you had your gallbladder removed, your body actually makes a new one, a little outpatching to hold bile. And the bile is where the mold toxins are concentrated. So in these patients, we need to use things like digestive bitters, orange oil, and ox bile. So I'm just kind of giving you an over, overview of how I think about things. When you're talking to me about your symptoms, I'm thinking about what is the pancreas doing? What is the gallbladder doing? What is the liver doing? What is the stomach doing? Because each different organ in the digestive system is actually really important for digesting different types of food. Um, and then here is the small intestine. I'm gonna show you a better picture in a minute. And the large intestine. And the large intestine is much wider, but it's also much shorter. The small intestine is about 25 feet, all curled up. And I think the, the large intestine or the colon here, it's only about nine feet. This is what 
the inside of the healthy colon looks like. And there are these folds called Hofstra. And if you have ever heard of diverticulitis, in patients with diverticulitis, there becomes these little out pouchings and the food can get stuck and then it can get infected because it actually like essentially breaks the mucous membrane barrier. I'm just looking at my notes to see if I skipped anything. Um, so leaky gut, I'm going to get to in a minute, but this is actually showing you candida on the right. So this is the healthy gut. And then this is the unhealthy gut. So you see how with the candida it's red and then there's white patches on the outside. Some of us, because of childhood trauma and because of candida as kids, we have chronic candida issues where every time we start to eat sugar, white sugar or corn syrup or alcohol or coffee again, we end up with candida again in the gut. And this is a very severe example of what the candida looks like in the gut, but it does have these white plaques, just like how you would picture um, if you had a vaginal yeast infection. Um, Biofilms, I'm going to get to in a minute because I mentioned it, but I didn't circle back. And then SIBO, I'm going to get to in a minute. The last things on these li this list are coming, I promise. But these are all different root causes of the gut issues. Um, now, what caused the leaky gut is, is all of the triggers we talked about. What caused the dysbiosis is either the C-section birth or the antibiotic use. What caused the candida is typically childhood trauma and sometimes sexual abuse and having been fed a terrible diet when you were a kid. So there's different things that cause each of these. Biofilms are caused by infections, chronic infections like Lyme and Epstein-Barr. And then SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is when the bacteria essentially migrate from the large intestine up to the small intestine, and they are in a location they should not be. I'm gonna show you a picture of that. So this is my own hand drawing trying to show you, here's the stomach. We wanna make sure there's no H. pylori. Here's the duodenum. And then here we go into the small intestine, which is all looped around. And then over here, this is really important on the right. So if you're looking at the patient, this would be their right side where the green is. And this right side of the patient is the ileocecal valve. This is super important. If you've ever been to the chiropractor and they pressed between your right hip and your belly button, they're trying to release the ileocecal valve. This is the most common reason for constipation is that the stool actually gets stuck there. So you can also do your own abdominal massage or just feel around your body. I encourage you to put your hands on your belly and kind of feel what's going on with your digestion. Am I bloated today? Are things moving? Is there any one spot that's really tender? Sometimes people over here on the left by the sigmoid colon, they'll have a tender spot. Um, but over here on the right, the bottom right, if you feel that it's tender there, take an exhale and gently push your fingers all the way deep. And I can show you on exam in the office and make sure that there's no stool stuck there. This is also where walking is really great for digestion because it kind of moves things through this ileocecal valve because there's a valve here that needs to open. Um, and then the other thing that's really great is yoga, which I'm gonna get to at the end when I talk about ways to treat this. Yoga and um, just doing hip circles where you're either standing or you're on all fours and you're just gently circling your hips clockwise and then counterclockwise. That can also help move the fascia, which helps release the intestine which is a good thing. Okay. Then up here, I just kind of reminded you that you can have leaky gut. It can, it can occur anywhere in the colon, but leaky gut or small intestine, but leaky gut is basically when the lining of the gut has spaces between the cells in the lining and the lining of the gut, unlike the skin is only one cell layer thick. The skin has eight layers, but the gut only has one. And so if you picture like shingles on the roof, the cells are supposed to be overlapping like shingles. And in leaky gut, they get a little fuzzy here and all the little ends of the cells kind of get peeled up, almost like you'd see like a laminate peeled up. And then that allows big giant proteins of food that should have actually come out in the stool to pass back through into the bloodstream. And the proteins in the food are what the immune system starts to attack. So if you have food intolerances, let's just say gluten, the gluten turns into gliadin 
And the gliadin is a protein that if you have leaky gut goes right through the lining of the gut back into the bloodstream where it shouldn't be. And then the immune system attacks it as if it's a foreign invader, like a bacteria. We know gluten is not a foreign invader, but your immune system does not. And that's how gluten intolerance starts. Lyme disease, I was just showing you a picture here. This is what the spirochetes look like. The Lyme disease, the spirochetes themselves will also form these big kind of mucus balls that are called biofilms. And it's like layer upon layer of, of carbohydrates that and mucus that protect the Lyme disease. So you can't get to it with the medicines that you're taking. This is why if you've had Lyme disease for more than a couple of weeks, antibiotics alone typically don't get rid of it. And why we need to focus on herbals and biofilm busters, which I can talk about more when we do a little talk on Lyme disease or chronic infections. Epstein-Barr is similar. Epstein-Barr is a virus, so it's a much bigger particle, which I'm showing you down here. Again, it can occur anywhere in the intestine. I'm just showing you it here. But the big viral particles, even though they're bigger than the bacteria or the, or the spirochetes, they still create biofilms. And it's really challenging to eradicate all of the Epstein-Barr from your body. It's still worth trying, but the viruses tend to linger and hang out for years after you had them. So if you were ever told you had mono, then you probably still have some Epstein-Barr circulating unless you've done specific things to help clear the Epstein-Barr. And on our YouTube channel, I do have a really good talk about Epstein-Barr and long COVID. And um, if you haven't watched that on our YouTube channel, I can link to it at the end if you're interested. Dysbiosis is just a word that means there's an imbalance of the good and the bad gut flora. So I drew this graphic so that you could see that you could have candida overgrowth and dysbiosis and Lyme disease and leaky gut and Epstein-Barr and other viruses. You could actually have all of them, or you could just have one, or you could have two. And this is why it's important that we do a full workup and we get some scientific data. Having said that, you know, when people can't financially afford to pay for every test, I can also make diagnoses based on symptoms and signs that patients are having simply because I've done this long enough that I've seen it all, right? Um, I don't think there's anything else I wanted to add there. I did want to mention a couple things, which is, let's see, let's go to the next one for leaky gut. So this is a good photo of leaky gut taken from Dr. Josh Axe, and he wrote a book called Eat Dirt. If you haven't read it, go ahead and read it because it's really good. Some of it's a little bit outdated because it's not a new book, but it's a really good book about how we should address our gut and our microbiome like gardening right? When you go garden in the soil, you want the soil to be really enriched with nitrates and fertilizers. And I'm not a gardener, but I've heard. And it turns out that the gut and the oral microbiome and the vagina are all very similar to gardening. So we don't want to kill all of the good stuff. We don't want to kill all of the bad just, and, and then by accident, kill all the good. And that's what antibiotics do. The leaky gut here is just showing you that there can be spaces in the lining of the intestine and these spaces between the tight, so there's, there's no more tight junctions here, there's leaky junctions. If you have the leaky junctions, which you shouldn't have, it can be caused by the things I mentioned before, pesticides, plastics, stress, caffeine, gluten. So a lot of things in our environment cause leaky gut. Alcohol, even if you have a perfect gut and there's nothing wrong with you, ne you've never had a complaint in your life, Every time you drink alcohol, it creates leaky gut. That's okay. Exercise creates leaky, leaky gut for a couple hours. That's okay. It's a physiologic response to the stress. And it actually allows you to very, very, very quickly absorb water and hydration. No problem. We can handle that if it's for a couple hours. If you have a drink and you want to do some collagen or um, slippery elm or charcoal after you have alcohol to make sure the gut is healed. Bone broth is great before you move on. Or if you want to do some fasting the next morning, that's the best way to go about this. The problem is when people are drinking so much alcohol that there's not time in between the alcohol for the leaky gut to heal. So I hope that makes sense. Similarly with gluten, gluten causes leaky gut in everyone, even people who do not have a gluten issue. It's not a big deal if you have gluten twice a week. It is a problem if you have gluten three meals a day. And I always joke that the reason I can't eat gluten is because I used up all my credits. 
because I used to have gluten three times a day, but I grew up in New York, New Jersey, where everything was made with gluten. Um, here's your bloodstream. And because of the leaky gut, he's showing you here with this graphic that there's some spirochetes and some bacteria that actually got right through the gut from the poop back into the bloodstream. So here on this side is where the poop is and it got right through. And now you've got things like lipopolysaccharides, which is a really long way of saying a byproduct from E. coli or a byproduct from a gram negative bacteria. And the lipopolysaccharide or the byproduct from the bacteria is this little yellow or green. And it goes to the brain and it causes brain fog. And so a lot of times when patients have brain fog or dementia, they have something called LPS or lipopolysaccharides in the blood. And that's because of the leaky gut. Okay, down here, he's just showing you what leaky gut causes. So we know leaky gut causes all of these things. And then this is where I'm gonna talk just for a moment. I'm not gonna spend too much time here on what happens. Why do we do testing of the gut? Why does it matter? And then how do you know if you need testing? So I wanna point out that this was actually my stool test from August of 2020, when my autoimmune disease got worse and I went from having two autoimmune conditions to three, I couldn't eat or drink because my esophagus was filled with candida and it felt like knives. So I couldn't swallow anything. And part of the reason the candida got so bad from the stress I'd been under had to do with the fact that I didn't have any of these beneficial bacteria. So these are key, keystone species, which means these are all species that we should find in your gut. And I don't know if you guys can see this, but I had one, two, that's it. Everything else my, in my sample was not detected. This is an old lab that we don't use anymore, typically for testing stool, but I thought this was a really good snapshot for you to show you we know dysbiosis or a lack of good bacteria in the gut causes autoimmune disease. And look at this. I mean, how was I not going to get another autoimmune thing when I had none of the good stuff in my gut? Here's the test that I now use today. Um, this was a different patient who I've took their name off of. And this is a really good example of when the person had a lot of symptoms, but the, the testing showed us that things were not really that bad. She had some elastase in her stool, which is good. She actually had enough elastase to, to digest. So this is showing you digestion. Um, she was a little bit low on fats in her stool, but that's because her diet was very low in fat. Um, you need everything in moderation. You need omega-3s. You need the fats that are liquid at room temperature. You really need those for the cells to be healthy. So we knew that she needed some more fat. So this was good testing of her stool. And I'm glad we did it because then we could advise her to have more fat. Um, everything else here, the, the secretary IgA, if this gets very high over, over 1900, I usually consider ulcerative colitis or, um, Crohn's disease. And that's because your body is attacking, your immune system is actually directly attacking your gut. So rather than an autoimmune disease, autoimmune disease where your immune system is attacking your thyroid, like in Hashimoto's or your pancreas, like in type one diabetes, in this case, this patient's was not high enough for me to be concerned. And this marker just means you've got a lot of inflammation in your gut. Okay. We already kind of knew that from her symptoms, right? But then if you look down here, her butyrate concentration was very low. Now butyrate is a healing short chain fatty acid that heals the lining of the gut and it's found in ghee. You can also take butyrate in capsules. This is the next page. So this is the most important page of the test results. And if you look at the DL, 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 all of these keystone are beneficial bacteria, which they call them commensal, but it's the same thing as keystone. All of these bacteria were missing. So what we had to do was we had to go through and figure out what foods can she eat that will promote the growth of these bacteria? What prebiotics or fibers can she take in that will help promote the growth of good bacteria? What probiotics can she take that might actually replace some of the missing good stuff? And unfortunately, not all of these are available in probiotic form. So in that case, we have to really focus on creating a really good environment for the bacteria to grow. Because there, even though it says DL, there might be a little bit, a tiny bit, it was just undetectable. 
Um, so, but this allows us to customize the person's probiotic. It allows us to customize their prebiotic and their fibers, and it allows us to customize their diet based on what their gut's doing. And then this is the last page that's really important. These are actually harmful bacteria, Shigella, E. coli, Morganella, Candida. These are harmful. And look, she didn't have really any of the harmful ones. She had a little bit more of E. coli than I would want, but nothing really pathogenic where it would actually be in the red here. So the good news is we didn't have that much work to do to heal her gut. We needed to get her some ghee or butyrate, and we needed to help give her foods that would feed all of the good bacteria. And isn't that interesting? It wasn't, she wasn't having a dysbiosis because there was a ton of bad bacteria in her gut. She was having a dysbiosis because she was missing a lot of the good stuff. This is the last thing I'm going to show you guys. Um, this is the food intolerance testing. So um, I don't remember what patient this was. It wasn't me. Oh, actually, I think this was the sample I took from the website, but I wanted to show you that egg yolk, coffee, pecans, and chias came up positive. So this is interesting because this person is reacting to these foods and not dairy and gluten. And I would not have assumed that based on their symptoms. Same thing down here. So they're reacting to the egg white, cashew, quinoa, clam, but at a much lower reaction. And then over here, zonulin was negative, which means there isn't technically leaky gut, but occludin can also show you that there's signs of leaky gut. So both the zonulin and occludin tell us, are there those gaps in the cells of the intestine allowing food to get through or toxins? And then candida was positive. So this person had had candida for many, many years because the acute antibody was negative and the long-term one was positive. So they've had candida for at least six, eight months, probably much longer than that. And we need to treat the candida, typically using herbs and diet changes and lifestyle changes. Um, treat the trauma. If there's underlying childhood trauma, again, that leads to candida. So this person needs therapy if they're willing. Um, it can be yoga therapy. It can be coaching, but they need some form of um, cognitive behavioral therapy or maybe EMDR or brain spotting, something to address some of the trauma because if we internalize trauma and don't get treated for it, then it often leads to candida. I just wanted to show you that this is the lab core testing. It is helpful, but only if someone's having hives or rashes or trouble breathing after eating the food, which most of our patients are not having IgE reactions. They're actually having the other one. This one back here is IgG reactions, food intolerances, not overt allergies. I still want them to go to a restaurant if they're eating out and tell the server, I can't have eggs because I want it to be treated like a food allergy so that we can actually make some progress and heal their gut. Oh, and then last couple of things, Kelly's gonna go over more of this, I know, but this is a squatty potty. Everybody should be using a squatty potty because it changes the location of the sphincter and allows you to have a complete bowel movement. If you feel at the end of a bowel movement, like you don't have a complete bowel movement, this should fix it. And I'm going to leave you with this quote from Harvard's website. Studies show that leaky gut may be associated with other autoimmune diseases, lupus, type 1 diabetes, multiple sclerosis, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, arthritis, allergies, asthma, acne, obesity, and mental illness. And that brings me to the schedule of topics. We are going to talk about how this is all connected. Um, at the next talk, we are going to do, so Kelly's gonna meet with you all on Zoom next Friday. And that is February 2nd at noon. And then part two, I'm gonna talk about acne, wrinkles, gut health, and what are the connections between the gut, oral, and skin microbiome? And so save the date because that'll be February 23rd at noon. And then Kelly's follow-up discussion is going to be March 1st at noon. And then the last talk we have scheduled is food for your mood and all of the treatments that help heal your gut, which I didn't even go through all of them today. Probiotics, aloe, okra, zinc, bone broth, licorice, omega-3s, vitamin E. We're going to talk about all of that at part three, where we go into the in-depth of the treatment. Now, having said that, when you all are being seen for your private visits with me, we're already diving into, or with Kelly and Kristen, you're already diving into what is healing the gut. Um, and if you're not a patient and you want to become one, just let us know. And then we may do a part four, but we don't have it scheduled yet. 
Um, but part three, the food for your mood and all of the treatment options is going to be March 15th at noon on Zoom. And then Kelly's going to do that follow-up discussion March 22nd at noon. And then we may do a part four, and that's just dispelling the myths, myths of diet and gut healing. I'm going to end the recording and then we can go through all the questions. I'm sure there's a way to do that. Here we go. Thank you.